We have to uh, be educating children, youth, young adults mm. in how to study the scriptures now because uh, and, and not avoid these passages because they're hearing them from other places and then it's catching them off guard. And, and so we have to be yeah. focusing on this for, for this time. So Dan, we were talking about TikTok videos and memes that, that uh, are telling people that if they read the Bible, they'll become atheists. And they're using misapplied Bible verses to critique and undermine the Bible. Here's, a, here's a, some examples. Um, the, these memes will say that the Bible is anti-women. It's, it's misogynistic. How do we correct that misunderstanding? Yeah, what's going on is you'll see a meme with a woman and her mouth is taped shut. Uh, or worse, there's like really uh, horrifically p depicted uh, memes of video uh, of women. Then what happens is uh, you'll see a verse like 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34. The Bible verse put right under the image with her, of the woman with her mouth taped shut. And the Bible verse will then say, women be silent. It is a disgrace for a woman to speak up in the church. She must go home and ask her husband questions then. So you see the image, an actual Bible verse, and of course that is going to be very confusing sounding, alarming, and seeing it pulled out with the graphic image is then confusing. That's how not to read the Bible. Don't just read a Bible verse in isolation. Always be asking who is it written to and why, what was going on in the context. Uh, understand genre, all of those normal things, and you'll see a verse like that, that actually was written around, it's written to the Corinthian church, around the year A.D. 55. Um, what you have to understand was the posture of learning at that time was to actually be quiet until you'd be learning more. It was not a slam directly against women to be actually quiet all of the time in churches because three chapters earlier in the same letter, Paul writes to, for women to be prophesying and praying. So it can't mean literally like just be quiet with your mouth taped shut and don't speak up. But what is happening is people are seeing these, and in a time, this is really important, a time where there's a lot of pressure, especially on younger people, if you're a Christian, you are hateful. You know, your God hates women. Your God is anti all of these things. It makes it more conducive for a, Christ, a younger Christian to say, maybe I can't believe this. There are really reasons. So again, the Bible is so pro-women, Phoebe, Deborah, Miriam, hold it like, all of these, all of these super positive things about women, but people are taking little verses and then trying to make a case against the scriptures from isolated verses like that. Context is always the king when it comes to understanding what Bible verses mean. And, and when we're talking about the ancient culture uh, where women and children were degraded and they were marginalized, there's nothing in all of ancient history that elevated the dignity and value of women than the Bible itself. And uh, I'm so glad that you've got a book that is explaining this to people. Here's another one. Uh, how about the memes that talk about the Bible being in favor of slavery? The Bible itself is 100% anti-slavery, the way we think of slavery, slave trading, you know, uh, kidnapping against their will. Exodus 21 verse 16 condemns by death someone that kidnaps someone for slavery against their will. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 and 10 condemns slavery. When you look at that worldview in the Old Testament, it was not what we think of slavery. It was a different form. It was people that were selling themselves to someone else for labor to get out of debt. Um, it might have been a family selling themselves into labor to someone else to avoid poverty or their daughters going into prostitution or something like that. So the Old Testament was an entirely different world then you look at the New Testament, and it wasn't race-based like we think. 30% of the, the Roman population around that time period were what we would call, think of as slaves. But again, it could be a doctor, a lawyer, someone selling themselves um, for, a, for you know, their, their vocation into a family of some sort. It was not kidnapped against their will slavery like we think of. The Bible condemns that. And then we'll see in the New Testament the trajectory of when, when people were becoming followers of Jesus and saying all people are equal before God, you'll see that as the start of the movement to abolish kidnapped slavery. 
there are reasonable answers for all of these kind of questions. Absolutely, Dan. Uh, there absolutely are. I'm so glad that you're pointing them out to us. And when I think of the Bible, the only pro-slavery verses I, I want to point to are where I myself have voluntarily come in humble repentance to become a bond slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, a servant of the Most High God. And uh, there, there's nothing else that I would want to be uh, than walking in step with Him. Hey, here's another difficult one. Uh, how about the verses that seem to indicate that God hates babies? Like in the Old Testament, where the Israelites went into certain lands, like with the Canaanites, and the babies were killed. What do we do with those? God did use violence at times. There were wars. There were times when, um, when violence did happen. But here's what you can look at. Every single time you will see God pleading. I mean, I, there's, I, I quote all the passages that you'll see of this. Please change your mind. Warnings about repenting. Warnings about judgment. Don't worship false gods. All of the, some of the horrific ways of worship that they were using child sacrifice and all of these things. At, after time and warning, God did use violence with armies and attacks to cities, um, which people died. But what happens, though, is you'll see things like there's a popular meme that's out there, all different forms of it, Psalm 137, verse 9, and it talks about uh, taking, like, please have babies get dashed against the rocks, like kill babies. You'll see these verses slapped up and, uh, and used like a verse saying, like, look, God hates babies. God's into violence. You have to then take that verse. Again, it looks really horrible seeing it. Is that true? God hates babies? Uh, wants to dash them against the rocks. What does that mean? You go back, who wrote that verse? It was a psalmist that was writing after Jerusalem was destroyed. And when they were destroyed, the Babylonians would actually take babies and infants and they threw them to kill them in, in war. What you'll see, it's a poem. It's a poetic expression of angst saying like, please God, you know, like we want revenge on those that were killing our children. And so you'll see that one verse used out of context, put up on memes and billboards. And you have to look at to what it was. It was not a command that God was saying. It was a anguished, probably, parent whose child might have been killed, who's writing a poetic ex expression there. It was not com God commanding that. Again, so many illustrations. that, And that's why the criticism against Christians are, seems like it's always like, you take the Bible out of context, you cherry pick. Most of the stuff that's going on is cherry picking the Bible the other way. We have to uh, be educating children, youth, young adults uh. in how to study the scriptures now because, uh, and not avoid these passages because they're hearing them from other places and then it's catching them off guard. And, and, and so we have to be yeah. focusing on this for, for this time. When we're talking about reading the Bible the right way, you talk about things not to do. Like, for instance, never read a Bible verse in isolation. What do you mean by that? You can take a Bible verse, pull it out of context, slap a graphic on it, uh, talk about it on TikTok or something, and miss the entire meaning of the verse. So never read a Bible verse in isolation. It's a, it's, uh, and that's a major cause of most of the issues, is reading Bible verses on their own without looking at context, who wrote it, why, genre, all of those things. And, and your book's gonna help us to understand how to read the whole passage and get it all in, in context. Here's, here's another one. You, you say that, remember that the Bible was not written to us, it was written for us, but not to us. What do you mean? Yeah, all right, say like, there's a lot of criticism and mocking of Christians today with, you know, uh, Christians, you eat shrimp. You're hypocritical. You're, you're taking in all of these strange laws, the Levitical laws and all of this. And again, it's who was it written to originally? That was written to the people of Israel after 400 years of slavery, being in slavery in Egypt, being moved in towards the promised land, moving towards Jerusalem where the temple is going to be built. And it was certain laws that God set in place to the people of Israel there are dietary laws like not eating shrimp and certain practices that sound really bizarre to us, but it wouldn't have been bizarre to them. There's laws that don't make sense to us, but they would have made perfect sense to God bringing them into the people of Israel. There's examples like in 1920-something in Arizona, there's a law still in our books that say it's illegal for a someone to keep a donkey in a bathtub. 
right? We read it today, that's so bizarre. You go back and you say, what was going on back then? In Arizona, in a specific town, a farmer had a donkey in a bathtub that he would keep there to have it sleep. A river uh, overflowed, moved the bathtub into a mud basin. They had a difficult time getting it out. And they basically said, Farmer John, you can't keep your donkey in a bathtub anymore. They made a law. If you lived back then, it would have made perfect sense. Today, it sounds so strange. The Bible was not written, those sections, to us, but for us to understand God. But an important thing. You then say, what carried through and what didn't? Strange things about dietary laws ended, but um, morals and sexual ethics and those things actually got more intense in the New Testament. So you have to see what carried through and what didn't. Who was the Old Testament written to and why? Again, basic Bible study methods, but not being paid attention to today. And so many people are getting deceived by false understanding of scriptures that's being put out there today. So if someone is looking to read the Bible and begin to study it for the first time, are there a couple of simple principles that you would recommend to them so that they're, writing, they're reading it the right way? Yeah, I mean, the, the good news is there's so many great resources out there today um, to help you. But, you know, in the beginning of the book, I talk about what we just kind of raised up. You have to understand the Bible is, you don't read it like a single book. It's a library of books written over 1,500 years, different genres, different purposes, different audiences. You have to pay attention to that. And there's so many wonderful, great resources out there today to help you do that. But then you have to take the effort to make sure you're reading them. There's, you know, the Bible's a library, not a book. Never read a Bible verse we just mentioned. The Bible's written for us, not to us. And all the Bible points to Jesus, understanding the storyline. I can't, again, that's so critical. A resource I would recommend is the Bible Project. I don't know if you've heard of it. They have short videos. I recommend that all the time for uh, free resources online of understanding the whole Bible uh, that all points to Jesus and looking at the context, history, genre, all of those things. Hey, Dan, thank you so much for joining us today and for the work that you've put into helping our culture become better students of Scripture. 